Tonight on The Readout. I'm not going to win mince words with you all. Democrats want Republicans dead, and they've already started the killings. Well, that kind of inflammatory rhetoric is what we've come to expect from the likes of Marjorie Taylor Greene. But what's really disturbing is the deafening silence when her colleagues are asked to denounce that kind of extremist talk. Plus, an environmental Ponzi scheme had developers of one Florida community prioritize lifestyle over safety and sustainability. Residents are now paying the price. And later, noted historian and filmmaker Henry Louis Gates joins me to talk about his highly anticipated new PBS series, Making Black America. Good evening, everyone. We begin the readout tonight with the global resurgence of fascism. Yesterday, Brazil held the first round of its presidential election, and the self-described Trump of the tropics, Jair Bolsonaro, emerged in second place, just five points behind the front-runner leftist former president Luis, Marcio, Luis Inacio Lula de la Silva. Because no candidate received 50 percent of the vote, Brazil's elections are headed to a runoff at the end of the month. According to the Associated Press, Lula de la Silva had 48 percent of the vote and President Bolsonaro had 43 percent. Bolsonaro outperformed the polls. In the lead-up to Sunday's first round, Bolsonaro, like the former American president, claimed that the election was rigged. Unsurprisingly, like Trump, Bolsonaro has openly praised dictators, paying homage to the 1964 political coup that resulted in roughly 20,000 people in his country being tortured. Bolsonaro, a former army captain, has used the military as a prop during his recent attacks against the Supreme Court and other institutions, openly flirting with the idea of a coup of his own. His language, much like Trump's, has increasingly divided the country. His base openly calls for blood in the streets. Bolsonaro has also promoted a return to religion, family values, and nationalism, a political philosophy parroted by the newly minted neo-fascist prime minister of Italy, Georgia Maloney, and by conservatives here in the U.S. In fact, Maloney's election was celebrated by U.S. Republicans. Texas Senator Ted Cruz called her rhetoric spectacular. And former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said, Italy deserves and needs strong conservative leadership. I mean, who cares, right, if that strong leadership involves demonizing minority communities and immigrants and threatening to revoke the free will of women? All good. Those same Republicans remained largely silent this weekend when their party leader, the twice impeached former president, launched into a racist social media rant attacking Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell's wife and seemingly summoning his supporters, once again, to violence. On Friday, using his much-ridiculed social media app, the 2020 election loser posted that McConnell has a death wish, in all caps, for having supported legislation to keep the government operating through mid-December. He then went on to smear McConnell's wife, Elaine Chao, his own former transportation secretary, by referring to her as his China-loving wife, Coco Chow. Naturally, the majority of the Republican Party didn't have much to say about any of that. Florida Senator Rick Scott, who is in charge of the Senate Republicans' re-election campaign arm, brushed it off <clears throat> as just another silly nickname. You're a member of the Senate GOP leadership. Are you okay with this? Well, look, I, I can never talk about, respond to why anybody else says what they said. As you know, you know, the president likes, likes to give people nicknames. You can ask him how he came up. Uh, with the nickname. Uh, I'm sure he has a nickname for me. I don't condone violence, and I hope any, no one else condones violence. Okay, well, it was left to the Murdoch-owned Wall Street Journal then to denounce what sure did sound like a death threat against the Senate minority, the Senate minority leader, since no Republican would dare to do so. In fact, Republicans have spent so long being timid or indifferent to Trump's outright racism and dalliances with violence, even McConnell didn't have the guts to defend himself or his own wife, shades of Ted Cruz. But the last time that they laughed off those threats and told us to take him seriously, but not literally, was when he summoned a mob to Washington and told them to fight like hell to overturn the 2020 election. Their indifference left at least seven people dead and resulted in the first time in modern American history that supporters of a losing candidate, well, actually the first time, period, that they assaulted our nation's capital. The Republican Party's complete refusal to hold Trump accountable allowed Stuart Rhodes, leader of the white nationalist right-wing paramilitary group, the Oath Keepers, to answer Trump's call to violence. And unlike Trump, Rhodes and four co-defendants are being forced to answer for their actions. Earlier today, jurors heard the opening remarks in a seditious conspiracy case against the members of the Oath Keepers, who, according to the Department of Justice, concocted a plan for armed rebellion and did whatever was necessary 
up to and including using force to stop the transfer of power from Donald Trump to President-elect Joe Biden. Rhodes' attorney said that he did nothing illegal and called the case against him completely wrong. Trump seemed to agree. He has said that he would look very favorably at full pardons for January 6th defendants if he becomes president again. And I'm joined now by Michael Steele, former Republican National Committee chairman and host of the Michael Steele podcast, and Thomas Zimmer, visiting professor at Georgetown University and contributor to The Guardian U.S. And I'm going to start with you, uh, Thomas. Uh, thank you for being here. I, I told you before... Um, we came on, I will say it again on TV, that your Twitter feed is sort of a <laughs> lifeline for me so that I know I'm not crazy when I talk about the fact that, and I've been talking about this for quite a few years, that fascism is coming back, right? That it's here in America and that it's real. I just laid through and went through a whole series of things from Trump threatening violence against the sitting minority leader in the Senate, attacking his wife racially, to what's happening in Italy. Um, is there a difference in your view to the kind of fascism that's coming here and the kind of fascism we're seeing in places like Brazil and, and in Italy? Well, look, fascism is a difficult term, right? Um, it was even difficult to define back when it arose in Europe in the 1920s and 30s because in many ways... Fascist, fascist movements were all over the place. They were more defined by what they hated right. than by anything else. They were um, violently um, anti-socialist, anti-liberal, anti-democratic, anti-pluralist. Um, I think, to me, what is very important is that there is a tendency in this country, in America, to look at all of this, the history of fascism, the sort of rise of fascistic movements, parties... Um, all over the quote-unquote West and beyond the West, you talked about Brazil, and see that as something that has no sort of equivalent in U.S. history, has no roots in U.S. history. But there is a domestic tradition, a domestic U.S. tradition of, um, well, if you want to call them fascist movements or ideas, or if you want to call them far-right, violent, uh, white supremacist, Maybe the terminology doesn't even matter all that much. Right. What is important is that in this country, yeah. right, there's always been a significant faction that has just not been on board with the idea of America becoming a multiracial pluralistic democracy. And that has always been willing to embrace violence, right, to prevent the country from ever becoming that. And there's a strong domestic tradition of this. And I think we need to grapple with that. Yeah. Because what we're seeing right now is not new, it's not an aberration. It is in tradition and sort of in line with these long-standing tendencies and impulses against democracy. And, and, and against, and, and you, I think you made a really important point, against multiracial democracy. That's, yes. the, that's the challenge. And Michael Steele, you had to deal with that challenge as the head of the Republican Party for a time, which is this sort of tension between, you know, are we a, a white country with some non-white people in it, uh, in which they get to be here, but they shouldn't be wielding power, right? Or are we a true multiracial democracy where the black president coming up doesn't cause a complete conflagration, doesn't upend the whole culture, right? Where people aren't pitting themselves into tribes to fight for power. The, the latter seems to be where the Republican Party has decided they are. No one is condemning the former president, who still, they talk about like he is still the president, for attacking the sitting minority leader of the United States Senate. Even Mitch McConnell isn't attacking for that. And let me play one more person, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Because one of the things, you know, Thomas Zimmer had a tweet thread today where he talked about Marjorie Taylor Greene and put her in the context that it's always they define their attacks on the other side by saying, no, no, we're the victims. We have to do whatever it takes because the other side is trying to hurt us. Here's Marjorie Taylor Greene. We're all targets now, though, for daring to push back against the regime. And it doesn't stop at a weaponized legal system. I'm not going to win mince words with you all. Democrats want Republicans dead, and they've already started the killings. They, they've already started the killings, Michael Steele. And so when you frame it that way, well, everything, anything goes. Anything you have to do to stop these people that are well, doing the killings. The yeah, that's the point. Uh, you grease the skids as much as you can. You create as much, uh, as little resistance by taking the most extreme posture rhetorically. Um, and, and in the past, when it was the John Birch Society, uh, when it was, um, you know, what we saw with John McCain doing the presidential race, the attacks on Barack Obama, the leadership of the party said no. They stood up against that. They responded to it, right? They didn't ahimada, 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 or go silent. 
um, they leaned into to reestablish and reaffirm the very self-same democratic principles that have defined the country, and more specifically, those things that we allegedly believed um, as Republicans about individual rights and liberties and freedoms, right? Now that's all thrown out. And I think Thomas puts his finger on a very important point, that this thread has always been a part of the American fabric. It has been woven in um, in various ways and at various times has been pulled on. Um, what we see now is instead of one group here or an individual idiot like Marjorie Taylor Greene pulling on it and being rebuffed, now you find an entire political construct is pulling on that thread and is trying to reweave this idea of democracy and pluralism. Yeah, a lot of white folks don't like the idea that you and me, Joy, represent an existential threat to their existence, right, in their view. Um, but the reality of it is we've been here for 400 some years and we've managed to work through a lot of that. Now you see this retrenchment and this regression away from this idea that that Rodney King moment can be a real thing. Can we all just get along? Um, and instead, they want to refute that. So uh, they put it in political context. Instead of saying, you know, white people are, are being threatened by black people or black people and Asians or minorities want to see white people dead, it's Democrats want to see white people, want to see Republicans dead. Republicanism representing this uber whiteness uh, that they're projecting uh, around the globe and certainly here in the country.